Hey, this is Christians Wake Up, and today we're going to be talking about a subject called What Jesus Says About Riches. Once again, What Jesus Says About Riches. And the reason we're doing this lesson is because there is a lot of um, new types of teachers in this day and age, teachers that they say of the gospel and that they're men and women of the gospel. And you're going to find out that there are some discrepancies and some differences in what they say what the gospel is and what the Savior says the gospel is. So we're going to start with a foundation scripture and get right into it. And we're going to go straight to Matthew chapter 24. And we're going to read actually verse three first. We're going to start with verse three and then go to verse four. Let's go there right now. All right, here we are, Matthew 24, verse 3, it says, And as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately, saying, Tell us, when shall these things be? And what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? So they want to know about the end of the world, that time. Verse 4 says, And Jesus answered and said unto them, take heed that no man deceive you. So the Savior himself said there would be deception in this last day and that man would be very deceptive and take heed that no man deceive you. Now we're going to go down to verse 11 and get through reading. Verse 11 says, and many false prophets shall rise and shall deceive many. And because iniquity, and you know what that word iniquity is, is lawlessness. And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold or shall grow cold. But he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. Listen, this part right here, 14. And this gospel, whose gospel? Is it Paul's gospel? As you say, it's Paul's gospel. We learned that Paul is not um, a false, um, a false uh, follower of Christ, but that he's been misrepresented it, as in our other lessons of true salvation. But is this gospel Paul's? Is this gospel uh, Moses? Is it Abraham's? Is it Elijah's? No, the gospel of the Savior. It says, and this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness. Listen again, for a witness unto all nations. And then shall the end come. So we see here that his gospel is going to be preached to every nation and every tongue. So we want to find out if this rich gospel that's being taught in this day and age, if it's of his mouth, is it the gospel or is it something else? Let's find out from the mouth of the savior, because remember, he only speaks what the father says. And that's what a lot of people forget as they're saying a lot of things about God told me this, or he told me to say that, or he told me to teach this way. Remember, Everything that the Savior spoke, he spoke only of the Father. Actually, let's just go to that. That's found in John chapter 12, verse 47. This is from the Savior's mouth right here. So this is not me making anything up right from the Savior's mouth. Verse 47 says, and if any man hear my words and believe not, I judge him not. For I came not to judge the world, but to save the world. He that rejecteth me, listen, and receiveth not my words, once again, and receiveth not my words, hath one that judges him, the word that I have spoken. So the word is going to judge those who don't receive his words. Then in green, it says the same shall judge him in the last day. 
for I have not spoken of myself, but the father which sent me, he gave me a commandment, what I should say and what I should speak. Once again, it was the father that gave him a commandment, what I should say and what I should speak. And I know that his commandment is life everlasting. Whatsoever I speak, therefore, even as the father said unto me, so I speak. Now, here we have the savior saying everything that comes out of my mouth was instructed to me. It was commanded to me of my father. I don't speak anything out of term. So everything that I say that you're supposed to do came from the father. Everything that I say that you're not supposed to do came from the father because I didn't come here on my own free will. I didn't come here to start giving you my commandments. I came to give you his commandments that he told me. So that's what I speak. And I'm saying that on purpose because a lot of people, they say, well, God told me this or God said, this is what I'm supposed to do. But then when you go to the mouth of the Savior and what he said, you'll find a huge discrepancy in what he said. Now, I'm, I said that for a reason, because we're going to do a Google search and the search is going to be what is the prosperity preaching? Because it just kind of flew up on the scene and I'm going to do a whole separate lesson on this to show you where it actually came from. But just for now, we're just going to scroll over here and we're going to look up right here. What is the prosperity preaching? Here it is. Prosperity theology. Prosperity theology is a religious belief. Once again, it's a religious belief among some charismatic Christians that financial blessing and physical well-being are always the will of God for them, and that faith, positive speech, and donations to religious causes will increase one's material wealth. So this is what they believe. And there's actually even books written on it about the, uh, the, the prosperity theology and the gospel. And they teach on these things. And they say that this is the gospel this is the gospel of God. This is the word of God, the word of faith. Let's go down. We're going to look at this right here. This is from um, Oxford Research Encyclopedia on, of religion. Right here says, what is the prosperity gospel explained? The prosperity gospel is the belief that God rewards those with right thinking, with health, wealth, and whole life abundance. It goes by many names known alternatively as the faith, health, and wealth, word of faith, or name it and claim it gospel. So I just want to give a brief uh, synopsis on the prosperity preaching. We're, like I said, we're going to go into this very detailed in another lesson. But for this one, we just know that it exists, that it's there, and it's something they say is God, that God wants you to be rich. And then they say, they use the one, he wants you to be rich. He has no sorrow with it. Now, let's go to this. And here's what I'm gonna let you know before we even go to it. Did you know that, that, that there are 25 scriptures in the gospel? And when I say the gospel, that's Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, the, the books that the world calls the gospel the books where the Savior was talking. Now, I'm just talking about the King James only right now. I'm not going to even get into any of the other books. We're just going to use those four, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. So there's 25 scriptures in the gospel that has the word rich in it, 25. But listen, I'm going to tell you right now, it ain't good when it mentions the word rich. Actually, there's only two scriptures in there that had the word rich in it that meant something good, but it wasn't about what we call on this earth rich. Like, you know, you have a whole bunch of money and you're, you're filthy rich. And you notice that everybody says you're filthy 
rich is a reason why they say filthy rich. But we're going to go over a few of these and see what it says, because we want to know from the mouth of the Savior and the gospel, the things that are written in the gospel, if this prosperity preaching where you're supposed to have this surplus of riches and and all this wealth and all this the things like that. Let's we just want to find out what the Savior says about it because we already read everything that the Savior says came from the Father. Okay. So we're going to scroll right back over here and we're going to go to Matthew chapter 13 and read verse 22. Right here, verse 22. Now this is the parable of the sower. But notice what he says about the thorny ground. Verse 22, he says, and this is the Savior talking. He also that received seed among the thorns is he, listen, that heareth the word. So heareth his word. And the care of this world and the deceitfulness of riches the deceitfulness of riches choke the word, the word that he's teaching and he becometh unfruitful. So how does a person become unfruitful when they hear his words, but then the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches, it comes in and it chokes the word that they heard and he becometh unfruitful. So right there, that's that's a negative con uh, connotation of riches. Let's go to another one. Let's go to Luke chapter 16, verse 10. And all the words I'm using in here are the words rich because that's they say that we're supposed to be rich and that Christians are supposed to be rich. And if you're poor, you're cursed. So we, we're going we're gonna to go with what they say. But let's check it through the mouth of the Savior. Luke 16, 10. Let's see what it says right here. He that is faithful in that which is least is faithful also in much. And he that is unjust in the least is unjust also in much. If therefore ye have not been faithful in the unrighteous mammon. See that word mammon is the word wealth the riches that they're talking about on this earth. It says, who will commit to your trust the true riches? Hold on. So mammon is a word that's interchangeable with riches. Notice that the word riches that we just got to reading, you see how it slanted to the right? That's called italicized. It means it was a word that was not originally in the script. So it really says, who will commit to your trust the true but we know that it's talking about riches because it's associating that word riches, this word right here, riches with this word right here, mammon. So that word mammon, we looked it up already. We know that it's the word wealth or riches. So they're interchangeable. So then one riches is unrighteous. And then the other one is a true rich. So we got two different types of riches. But let's get to reading. We'll, we'll see right here. We'll prove that. He's talking about the world riches not being the true riches because right in verse 12, it says, and if ye have not been faithful in that which is another man's, what do men have? Riches. What do they give to you when you do service? They give you money. Then it says, who shall give you that which is your own? So now he's talking about his heavenly father. When we get our reward, remember the scripture says he that endure to the end shall be saved. See, that's the true riches right there. Salvation, eternal life. That's the true riches. Verse 13. And this is why this says it right here. No servant can serve two masters. So we have the unrighteous mammon and the true riches. See, those are two different masters. So no servant can uh, serve two masters for either he will hate the one and love the other or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. And then he tells you flat out 
what the true riches are. Ye cannot serve God. Hold on. So God is the true riches. Then it says, and mammon, but the mammon of this world is unrighteous. So you cannot serve God and wealth. Right here out of the Savior's mouth. I'm going to leave that word wealth up for a second. You can't serve God and wealth. This is from his mouth, not from mine, right from his mouth, red letters from the Savior. And if, it, if the Savior said it, guess who also said it? Guess Actually, let's do it different. If the Savior said it, guess who told him to come to tell us to say it? The Father. Because remember, he doesn't do anything outside of what the Father has told him to do and say. Let's go to another scripture. Let's go to Matthew chapter 19. Verse, let's start at verse 16. This is a story about the rich young ruler who came to Jesus, Yeshua. Verse 16 said, and behold, one came and said unto him, good master, what good thing shall I do that I may have eternal life? And he said unto him, why callest thou me good? There is none good but one, that is God. But if thou wilt, and that word wilt is if you want to enter into life. So now he's given life, which is the true rich, uh, riches. Keep the commandments. Verse 18, he said unto him, which? Jesus said, thou shalt do no murder. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not bear false witness. Honor thy father and thy mother, and thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Let's keep going. Let me just scroll right here. The young man said unto him, all these things have I kept from my youth up. What lack I yet? Jesus said unto him, if thou wilt be perfect. So now he's talking about perfect. He said, if thou want to be perfect, here's how you do that. Go and sell that thou hast and give to the poor and thou shalt have treasure. Hold on. The world says that the treasure we're supposed to have is on this earth. But he said, give your treasure up on this earth right here in the scripture. Go sell that thou hast and give to the poor and thou shalt have treasure in heaven. And come and follow me. But when the young man had heard that saying, he went away sorrowful for he had great possessions. He was rich. Verse 23. Then said Jesus unto his disciples, verily, I say unto you that a rich man shall hardly enter into the kingdom of heaven. See, that's the reason why we just read that scripture. That he will either love the one, hate the other. See, he, he went away sorrowful because he hated what the Savior asked him for. He loved his riches. Verse 24 says, and again, I say unto you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. Now, Everything we've read so far, does riches sound like something that you want to be a part of and that you should um, obtain or acquire, that you should be passionately chasing after? I'm just talking about from what the Savior says. Don't hate me. Well, you're probably going to hate me for saying it if you if you love money. But hey, it is what it is. But it came from the mouth of the Savior first. Let's go to another one. We 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 going we going to exhaust this list and we only going to do it with the gospel. Let's go to another one. Let's go to Mark chapter 12. Now remember, whole lot of prosperity preachers out there saying how God told them we should be rich. Mark chapter 12:41 through 44. Here we go. Verse 41 says, and Jesus sat or Yeshua sat over against the treasury and beheld how the people cast money into the treasury. And many that were, listen, rich. 
cast in much. Now, hold, let's let's pause. So they cast in a whole lot of money. Are we casting in a hundred thousand dollars. We're doing all we hey, we giving them we giving a half million a day. So they cast in much. Verse forty two. And there came a certain poor widow, and she threw in two mites. Now let me show you what two mites is. Two mites is small copper coins. So two small copper coins. Then it says, which make a farthing. A farthing was a Roman coin. So two copper coins is equivalent to a Roman co to one Roman coin. So she cast in this little Roman coin. I'm sure all the rich people's casting in gold and stuff like that, silver and gold. Verse 43. And he called unto him his disciples and said unto them, Verily I say unto you that this poor widow hath cast more in. Now remember, she just cast in a Roman coin or two copper, uh, two copper um, coins. He said that this poor widow hath cast more in than all they which have cast into the treasury. For all they did cast in of their abundance, their surplus. But she of her want. See her, she, she did it out of her poverty. She of her want or her poverty did cast in all that she had, even, even all her living. Now, if you've gone to any prosperity uh, ministry church event, what is the predominant, uh, pro, excuse me, let me repeat that. What's the predominant thing that happens there? It's giving. And who do they exalt that gives? Those who give the most. Those who, oh, brother says so, and they bring attention to them. Brother, we, we, we got a blessing today. We were believing for, and such and such gave $10,000. Hallelujah. I praise him. And they're exalted. But then who gets missed over is that poor grandma, that widow, the one who whose husband died or whatever, who's in that meet, who's in that meeting, who believes God blessing. She only has three hundred dollars in her savings account and she gives two hundred dollars of that and puts it in there. See, to them, that's insignificant. She just cast in 200 while this other guy put in 10,000. We're going to exalt and praise him. But the Savior is like, no, 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 no. No, he, see, he cast out of his surplus, out of his wealth. She cast in out of her need. So that right there shows you the difference between the rich and the impoverished. Who did the Savior say was more blessed? Was it the rich guy? Or the one who had the poverty. It was the one who was impoverished. That was the blessed one in this situation. So right now, it's still not looking good for this prosperity rich teaching. It's looking good for those who were impoverished, who are struggling. Let's keep going. Let's 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 keep going. See if we got anything in here. Let's go to Luke. Let's see, Luke chapter one, verse 52. Now, this story is about Mary. She, she's in the gospel. And this is a story I'm going to just scroll up here. The Holy Spirit spoke through Mary. Uh, where is it at? Right here. Um, she was talking to Elizabeth. I'm just trying to find where it first starts. Right here. Uh, Luke 1, 41. It says, and it came to pass that when Elizabeth heard the salutation of Mary, the babe leaped in her womb. That's John. And Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Ghost. She got the Holy Ghost right there. Then Elizabeth started speaking, saying, blessed art thou among women and blessed is the fruit of thy womb. But then listen. We go to verse 45 and it says, and blessed is she that believed, for there shall be a performance of those things which are told her from the Lord. And Mary said, my soul doth magnify the Lord. 
So now we have her. And then, oh, no, let me get to reading this. Verse 47. And my spirit hath rejoiced in God, my savior. But then we go on down here and she starts prophesying or starts speaking through the Holy Spirit. Verse 52 says, he hath put down the mighty from their seats and exalted them of low degree. Now, what did we just read in the last chapter? He exalted the woman who gave the two mites, who gave the two copper coins. Then look at verse 53. He hath filled the hungry with good things and the rich he hath sent empty away. Just remember that scripture. He sent the rich empty away. So we see right here, once again, when he talks about riches and talks about those who are rich, there's not a benefit to it, to being rich through the mouth of the Savior and the gospel. Here we have, once again, Mary talking through the Holy Spirit. Not a good sign when it says the rich he sent empty away. Okay, let's go to Luke. We're going to stay in Luke, but we're going to go to Luke chapter 12 and read verse 16. It says this right here, verse 16. And he spake a parable unto them saying, so this once again is Jesus, Yeshua, Yahushua, right here. The ground of a certain rich man brought forth plentifully. And he thought within himself saying, what shall I do? Because I have no room where to bestow my fruits. And he said, this will I do. I will pull down my barns and build greater. And there I will bestow all my fruits and my goods. And I will say to my soul, soul, thou hast much goods laid up for many years. Take thine ease, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said unto them, or unto him, excuse me, thou fool. Let's just pause before we even read the rest. Now, let's look at the stuff that he called a fool, starting with verse 18, because he said, this is what I do. And this is what he called him a fool at. He'll pull down his barns. So he said, you're a fool for that and built greater. So he said, you're a fool for building greater and will bestow all my fruits and my goods. And he said he was a fool. Then he said, and I will say to my soul, so thou hast much goods laid up for many years Take thine ease, eat, drink, and be merry. He said, fool, fool, fool. See, that's the equivalent of, uh, what is it called? Prosperity retirement to where you do nothing else because you've accumulated so much wealth that you get huge bank accounts, get a Swiss bank account, get a bank account across the world. You got bank accounts in every country now or three or four different countries. You uh, liquidated your assets, put them in different places, but then you kept enough so that you have your living here and you're looking at everything. You're like, you know what, man, I got all this stuff now. I'm, I'm about to eat, drink, and be, I'm about to live my life in prosperity, live the American dream. He said the American dream is foolish and calls anybody who does that a fool. It says this night, verse 20 again, in, in uh, blue, thou fool, this night thy soul shall be required of thee. Then whose shall those things be which thou hast provided? Now, this verse right here. So is he, 21. So is he that layeth up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. How are you rich toward God? What did he tell the rich young ruler who said he only lacked one thing? He said, go sell what thou hast, give to the poor, follow me, and you shall have treasure, hit the true riches. You'll have treasure in heaven. See, 
The world wants you and even prosperity preachers want you to believe you can have your pie. How, how do they say have your uh, pie in the sky, but have it here, too. You can have it here, too, and in the sky and you can live rich here and in heaven. Because that's what God wants. He wants the, he wants you to have all the riches here on earth as much as you can and in heaven. Does that sound like right here what he said? Does that sound like when he talked to the rich young ruler, what he meant? We just being real. I'm talking real soft. I'm just being real right now. I'm just talking words of truth. And at, at some point in our life, we got to come to the truth at least. Or if, if you come to the truth, and you're like, nah, I'm still not going to believe it. Then cool. Don't believe it, even though it's true. But at least you said you don't believe it. I'm cool with that. But what I'm not cool with is trickery and deceptiveness. Reading all the scriptures about wealth, but never going to the true source, the salvation source, the one who said, my father sent me, the one who said, the words that I speak, I speak of the father, him. Why do prosperity preachers avoid these scriptures? Let's keep going. So this is right here. This We just got to read. Let's see. Luke 12. Let's go to Luke 16. Actually, I mean, let me just scroll over. Luke 16, verse 19. Yeah, let's start right there. Verse 19. And there was a certain rich man. Here we go. We got the rich again. Now, listen, the Savior's talking all this stuff about riches. Don't you see the picture that's being painted right now from the Savior's mouth? Not from mine, from the Savior's mouth. It says, once again, there was a certain rich man which was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared. See that word fared right there? He lived in luxury. That's the American dream. The American dream is to live in luxury. So he fared or lived in luxurious, uh, luxury sumptuously every day. And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus, which was laid at his gate full of sores and desiring to be fed with with the crumbs, which fell from the rich man's table, from the rich man's table, from the rich man's table. So he was outside at his gate begging like, dude, I'm hungry. Can you get now you need to pull yourself up off your boots by, by, you, by your own feet. That's how you do it. I did it. That's how you got to do it, too. That's what a lot of people say. You, oh, you just begging you. That's not godly. OK, we're about to find out if that was godly or not. Once again, verse 21 and desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked the sores or licked his sores. Verse 22 says, and it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried away by the angels into Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. No angels carried him. He just died and was buried. Verse 23. It says, and in hell, he lifted up his eyes. Wow. Now, why did he go to hell? And he was rich, full of all this luxury, living the American dream. It says, in hell, he lifted up his eyes, being in torments with the nest, and seeth Abraham afar off, and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus. Now, I don't even know why he asked to send Lazarus, the one he wouldn't even give him anything off his rich table. Wouldn't give him the crumbs. None of that. He said, have mercy on me and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue. For I am tormented in this flame. But Abraham said, son. Remember that thou in thy lifetime, listen, in thy lifetime, receiveth thy good things. This is such a huge statement because 
a prosperity teaching. I'm, and I know the world teaches this too, but I'm, I'm going on more of the prosperity teaching because when you say you follow Christ and then you follow these teachings that teach you to be rich and to have surplus, but then they never teach you to give that wealth away, to be content with what you have. But they teach you to get more and more and more and more. But it says right here in green, remember that thou in thy lifetime receivest thy good things. And likewise, Lazarus, evil things. Now, hold on. That goes against what the prosperity teaching says, because the prosperity teaching says to be poor is to be cursed. And Lazarus was cursed on the earth with evil things. But then look at it right here. It says, but now he is comforted and thou are tormented. Which we're going to end with this right here. We're going to prove this statement by the Savior. It's not only true, it comes out of the mouth of two or three witnesses because he said it again in a different way. We're going to go to Luke chapter 6, 24. Actually, I, I want to read, even I want to go up and read before I even read that. Because right here in Luke chapter 6, verse 20, it says, and he lifted up his eyes on his disciples and said, and this is the first thing he said, blessed be ye poor. See, prosperity teachers teach you that if you're poor, you're cursed. The father said, blessed be ye poor for yours is the kingdom of heaven. What did Lazarus just get? We just got the reading. He was in Abraham's bosom. He wasn't being tormented. But was that rich guy being tormented? The one who trusted in mammon and made mammon his God instead of making the true riches, which was the father, his God and listening to the savior. Nope. And that's why we get to verse 24. But woe unto you who are rich. And that word woe, and we know what happened to, to the scripture we just got through reading. That word woe right here. Woe, alas, woe. Let's go to search the web on that word woe. Ah, stay signed out. Let's see right here. Look what it says. Great sorrow or distress. Often used hyperbolically. Woe. Similar says misery, sorrow, distress, sadness, unhappiness, heartache, heartbreak. Then I read below, it says things that cause sorrow or distress, troubles. Then similar, it says trouble, difficulty, problem, trial, tribulation, burden, miss. Fortune. See, they used to have the fortune, but now, and I'm going to click on misfortune, an unfortunate condition or event. See, this is what happens when you trust in riches, when you go to riches. That's why the love of money, riches, is the root of all evil, because it causes misfortune, an unfortunate condition or event. And that Condition or event is called, let me go back to it. Here's what that condition is back in Luke 16. Uh, where is it at? That condition right here. Uh, verse 23. And in hell, he lifted up his eyes, being in torments. So the rich ruler had a misfortune. He was misfortunate because his situation changed from being rich to being in hell. So we see that. Now let's go. Oh, I want to go back to that uh, Luke 6 for a second because I want to read. Let me see. Luke 6. Where were we at? Verse 24. 
right here. Verse 24 says, but woe unto you that are rich for you have received your consolation. So what you get on this earth is your consolation. I want to read that in the Amplified because I love the way the Amplified says it right here. That's highlighted in yellow. Verse 24. But whoa, judgment is coming. We saw what happened with the rich young ruler. Judgment came to him. So whoa, judgment is coming to you who are rich. And place your faith in possessions while remaining spiritually impoverished. See, that's what that rich young ruler was. He was spiritually impoverished. For you are already receiving your comfort in full. And there's nothing left to be awarded to you. And that's the reason why. And I'm going to go back to Mark chapter 10. Verse 24. That was the reason why right here he said this. Verse 24. And the disciples were astonished at his word. This is talking about that rich young ruler who walked away right here. Verse uh, 22. And he was sad at that same and went away grieved for he had great possessions. Then I read verse 23. It says, and Jesus wrote Yeshua looked round about and said unto his disciples, how hardly shall they that have riches enter into the kingdom of God. And the disciples were astonished at his words. But Jesus answereth again and said unto him or to them, children, how hard is it for them that trust in riches to enter into the kingdom of God? What Jesus says about riches. So I'm doing this because I came from a uh, prosperity teaching. Now, pretty much my whole life, I've, I've been in a um, prosperity uh, teaching type of atmosphere. And there, once again, there is nothing wrong with being prosperous. He never said that. What was wrong was not telling people to take their prosperity, to give it to the poor, to those who are in need, the widows, and share that wealth. Not just, not just a few of a little bit of it and say that you shared it, but to share that wealth with your brethren and your sisters. Because remember, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. You are supposed to share it. So that's the reason why those who are rich on this world, who stay in that state, the consolation of their riches is only here. It will never be in heaven because they did not keep his commandment. They loved another God. They actually broke both of the two greatest commandments. Love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, all thy soul, all thy mind. But what did he say? You can't love God and mammon, but they love mammon. Then the second greatest commandment is just like the first. Love thy neighbor as thyself. But what happened? The rich man didn't share his wealth with the poor. Lazarus. He stockpiled his wealth instead. Didn't share it. And what happened? He received his consolation on earth. But when it was time for the afterlife, he ended up in hell being tormented. I don't want that to be you. I don't want that to be any one of my brothers and sisters who are trying to endure to the end. You know what you got to do, and I'm not going to tell you what to do. All I wanted to show you was the words of the Savior and the words that they don't use when they teach this prosperity teaching. Most of them. I'm not going to say all of them. Most of them, though, don't teach this part. They leave this part out on what the Savior said, and then they say, there's nothing in the scriptures that's, that where somebody says that prosperity is wrong. That is bull crap. When we just got to reading all these scriptures from the Savior, that is a bunch of bull crap and lies. Listen to the words of your Savior. Figure out who your Savior is. I guess I should say that. Figure out who your Savior is and listen to him. We on this channel choose to listen to our Savior, Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus Christ, 
Yahushua Matzah the Lamb. I hope this lesson was edifying and built you up. And I hope that you take to heart the things that were said out of the mouth of the Savior. And that we do, we be doers of the word and not hearers only. Hey, this is Christians Wake Up. With that said, I'm out.